Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jerry Renault. On this episode, Mike Briggs looks at cattle markets, Shanna Plehall discusses the benefits of pulse crops. Alexander Tonin Rosa and Samuel Kieschel explain their research on field peas. And Martha Schultzke shares information about Nebraska State Climate Office's Mesonet weather stations. Mike Briggs is our market analyst this week. On June 22nd, the USDA released the latest cattle on feed report. According to the report, cattle on feed in the United States totaled 11.6 million head on June 1st. That's 4% higher than last year at this time and is the highest June 1st inventory since the series began in 1996. Placements on feedlots during May totaled 2.1 million head, slightly above 2017, and marketing of fed cattle during May totaled 2 million head, 5% above last year's total. Feeder cattle prices were a bit lower this week, However, the dropping corn prices are providing support. We talked with Mike Tuesday morning about the latest supply and demand levels and the increase in inventory, but began by asking him for his assessment of the latest cattle on feed report. They were expecting a bullish report. Not only did they not get that, they got kind of a bearish report. So they really pounded the market yesterday and, and today they're trying to hover, but I don't know how, I think the ice under the market's a little thin. I think it might go again. What's the bottom line here? We've got too many cattle. This has been advertised for months and months and months. And I, I believe I said on the last show, I never liked the market after Memorial Day because your beef demand starts to go down. We're gonna have 4th of July next week and then you're in the dog days of summer and we've got too many cattle and I think we're really gonna struggle. And that's just our market. And then you've got all the stuff going on in Washington, D.C. and around the world. It really is going to make it tough, I think. Let's talk about that briefly. Um, what do you tell people when they ask you about what's happening with the trade situation? The demand still seems high for China at this point and in some other areas. The demand is good. China China's insignificant at this point. I hope at some point, I believe our president's playing a big game of bluff, bluffer, liar's poker, whatever. And I think he's gonna get his way at some point. I think we're gonna have some short-term pain for some long-term gain. But I hope when he gets it, done, gets it done as far as China, I hope that we have some better trade agreement there than what we have now, because what we have now is a joke as far as I'm concerned. Um, the amount of cattle that will qualify for what they wanna do is very small. I'd like to see it be a little bit bigger. But yes, exports as a whole are doing great. And I don't really see that to change but yet you always want to increase that, especially when you have this supply of beef that we have in front of us right now. And you also have a huge supply of pork and pork is cheaper than beef right now. And I, that's, those features are really going to get to us here pretty quick, I'm afraid. Let's talk a little bit about demand, both from uh, an export status and from a consumer perspective. Well, beef prices are lower than they were last year. So from, from a value standpoint, the consumer's got a pretty good value there that he can get after. Exports have been tremendous. I, I assume they're going to continue as such unless the dollar would get out of hand, but I don't think that's going to be the case. You know, there's a lot of trade concerns and things like that going on. I hope our president's playing a big game of liar's poker here and he gets what concessions he wants and that will make exports even go better. And we could use that right now because we have such a tremendous supply of fat cattle here for the next month to six weeks. And depending upon how we as cattlemen manage that supply, 
that's going to have an effect on the price going forward. What do you tell people when they ask you, what should I do? Because a lot of people are waiting. Uh, don't wait unless, you know, I'm, ta I'm talking about cattle that you have to go in the next month to six weeks. I really think we're in a lot of trouble here. I think they're going to grind this down on us. You've seen a drop in corn prices, so that gives the, guy, gives the guys incentive to put on more pounds, get these cattle bigger, which ultimately means more pounds of meat on that market whenever they come to market. I just think this is what's been advertised, the big cattle tsunami. This has been getting advertised for six months, and, and we're in it right now. So I think it's, we're going to struggle here for a little bit. If we talk about placement, you're doing well? We are. We picked up some customers. I bought some cattle whether it be right or wrong uh, earlier this year for delivery at this time period because we always struggle with capacity management this time of year. So we're pretty full. Um, and you kind of saw that in the cattle on feed. You saw a bigger placement number than what was expected and you saw a bigger on feed number than what was expected. The interesting thing there, if you looked at the weight breakdowns, our placements weren't really big cattle. They were a lot of five and six weight cattle. Well, those cattle our first quarter of next year cattle. So that's not something that I don't think will affect the market, but it was just the fact that there was more placements and you saw bigger cattle on feed. So there's, there's plenty of cattle out there. You mentioned prices. They're probably not quite where you'd like them to be right now. No, no, we're definitely in the red ink in, in cattle right now. And some of these cattle are still cattle. Well, most of these cattle are still cattle that went through the winter and so the performance isn't what you wanted it to be. So your break-evens aren't what they wanted it to be and the market's not very good shape. So if you didn't have some price protection on, it hurts pretty bad right now. Are we still seeing some disparity with the packers making more money? You are gonna continue to see that disparity because they've got a supply. And you know, years ago, when, you know, several years ago, five, six, seven, eight years ago, when they started closing packing plants because of the extended drought and the, the reduction of the cattle supply, well, that's coming home to roost right now because there's not enough hook space to process as many cattle that are out there. You know, we're, we're probably down almost 100,000 head of slaughter capacity from where we used to be. Now, we don't need all of that, but we certainly could use a little more than what we have so the packers had to compete a little better, then maybe they wouldn't be getting such a big margin. Are we still seeing uh, a little help from lower corn prices? Yeah, but that there's also that also, like I said earlier, that'll add a little temptation to people to make the animals bigger and then consequently put more pounds on the market that maybe the market really doesn't need right now. But right now the weather has been really good. Now we're coming into a critical time of year. I would like to think the corn's kind of forging a low here because your rains are going to become less frequent as we go through the summer and maybe see a little bit higher corn price from here but I don't know that it's going to be anything that gets real out of hand. It, that depends on mother nature. We have some warmer weather coming. Heat stress a problem? You know, it can be. Now we've been really fortunate this year. We haven't had any of those days where it's really hot and still. Every day that's been really hot, we've had excellent wind. So we haven't had a lot of heat stress here. But once again, when it gets hot in the summer, the wind doesn't blow. So it can really be a, it can really be a challenge. Give us your prediction for the next few months. I think we're gonna struggle here for a little bit. I, I don't see anything good till we get in November. I really don't. I think we're really gonna struggle July and August, but Maybe we'll get a for maybe we'll forge a low this month and start working it higher, but right now I'm not I'm not liking the market very much. Next week, DTN's Todd Holtman will join us to look at corn and soybean markets. Last week, Nebraska Extension Cropping Systems educator Strahinya Stepanovich shared information about pulse crops. This week we continue to learn more about the benefits of pulse crops with Shanna Plehall from Great Northern Ag. According to Shanna, education is the key, and it's important to be aware of how pulse crops can change the dynamics of the soil. We talked with Shanna at the Nebraska Extension Wheat and Pulse Crop Field Day to discuss the possibilities of pulse crops in western Nebraska. Um, I guess our biggest thing when coming here, obviously this isn't really a pulse growing region at this point. Um, so a lot of it at this point is just education, education to the grower on what types of markets are on this side of the state, you know, what the pulse crops can do in their rotations and for their soils. Um, it not being very popular on this side of the state, I think it's really important that they just at least get a baseline on does it make sense to grow this, can we market it, you know, is it going to be a good thing for us or not. 
Yeah, one of the things that we talked about when we were doing our little tour was that, that it's hard to convince uh, some growers to make that change. And, and particularly, um, you were talking about South Dakota, that they're having a lot of success and they like what they're doing, but it seems like life is gonna be changing uh, down the road and that education is really critical. You know, where we come from, or like here, it's a corn, soybean, wheat rotation. You get a lot of just chemicals that growers use over and over and over again because they're in the same rotations. And I think that just incorporating pulse crops into their rotations could really change, you know, the dynamic of their soils. And maybe, I mean, even give them some more opportunity as the markets continue to change with the pulse crops and come further east, because right now they're just kind of more in the western part of the state. Yeah, talking to some of the farmers on the way out, I said, so are you thinking about planting some peas now? And he said, boy, you know, I wish I could. I just, I just don't know where. Right, yeah, I would say, you know, the biggest thing is talk to their local agronomists. And I mean, maybe even some of the agronomists here aren't privy just because they have been in the corn, wheat, soybean rotation so much. But like the guys at the research center and those kind of people, talk to them and see how can we start to incorporate it, even if it's just a small amount of or acreage into their farm and just see if it's something that'll work for them. What are kinds of the things you say to them to try to at least get them thinking about this? I just think what's important is, you know, talking to growers about how their operations are working right now. I mean, if, like I said, if something's working for them or if their whole operation is just great and they're happy with it, why would they want to change? That just doesn't make any sense. But if there's something that they want to change or a piece of land that's not quite working for, you know, their corn, soybean, wheat rotation, maybe we can incorporate some of these pulse crops in and, you know, help them be successful in what they're doing. Um, yeah, I guess just, I mean, if they're looking for a change, we're happy to help them. As Shanna noted, if growers would like more information about pulse crops, she recommends they talk to their local agronomists. Research has shown that forage cover crop systems can be successful with seed corn, wheat, and soybeans. Here in Nebraska, UNL Cropping Systems graduate research assistant Alexander Tonin Rosa is conducting research in the western part of the state on cover crops with field peas. The goal of his research is to see if diversification of crop rotation can help spread the financial risk. In addition, a few other factors he's considering are shorter growing seasons and nutrient recycling. At the Pulse Crop Field Day, we also had the chance to talk with Alexander to learn more about his cover crop research. So the main message that we wanted producers to see uh, is that we can diversify the, the crop rotation here in western Nebraska. We know that corn and soybean is the main rotation and is two strong cash crops, but we, we also know that the market fluctuates. So we are coming with this idea of putting post crops. And since they have short season, short growing season, we can uh, include other alternative crops following up like cover crops, forages, and even short season corn, soybean, and grain sorghum. So basically with cover crops, we can have multiple benefits that most of producers around the area are aware of, like uh, reduce soil erosion, uh, inc increase water infiltration, and also decrease the weed suppression that they, they might have here since uh, this new rotation will have new chemical uh, also chemical rotation. And with forages, we can also have the benefits of cover crops, but bring together another cash crop because you can graze it, or you can hay, or you can even silage those. And with short season crops, we will try to put corn with 70 day maturity groups and soybeans uh, shorter than 2.0 maturity groups. And what would be some of the advantages of, of going through that and doing that process? So like I said, the, I think the main advantage would be that uh, you would decrease the risk of the market, of the prices. So you spread those financial risk over three years, let's say, because you will have corn, soybean enough right after the post crops with the short season crops or grazing. And the benefits of those specifically post crops cover and cover crops is that you will be increasing your soil health, you will reduce your weed pressures, uh, you will have more uh, nutrient cycling, which is very important uh, in this area as well, because those crops can dig up, dig in the soil and bring some nutrients that are not always available when you are in the corn soybean rotations, for example. 
One of the things that we've discovered uh, today is that education really does seem to be the key to helping people out, but also there needs to be a little bit more research done. So we have some more statistics and numbers that we can show to people. What, what are some of the things that you're working on in your research? So my research is basically in the western part of Nebraska where we are working a lot on, on cover crops like termination times, different species. And what we are trying is to bring some of that knowledge here to the eastern part and we, in association with uh, field bees so we can see if they are uh, this whole rota new rotation will uh, come with better profit for the producer and also I, I would say that the, the key things is the agronomic and economic sustainability of the system. What is really the, the main difference between the west and the eastern part of the state? Sure basically is the water the precipitation regime uh, out here we we have, I'm not sure how many inches more, but it's a much wider conditions. So I would say it's much easier to include those rotations than in the west part of the state, where we have basically wheat and corn. And the challenges there are always facing towards uh, water conservation. Whereas here we can uh, play a little more, more on that direction, like uh, we can put more crops and diversi diversify more the system. Next week, Iowa State Extension Livestock Economist Lee Schultz will provide his analysis of the latest USDA Quarterly Hogs and Pigs report. Jeffrey Karstens, who grew up in Randolph, Nebraska, is a curator for the collection of woody landscape plants at the North Central Region Plant Introduction Station located in Ames, Iowa. Jeffrey spends most of his time in the woodlands collecting tree seeds from across the U.S., a particular seed that interests Jeffrey is the ash seed, which he collects for the Ash Conservation Project. With the onslaught of emerald ash borer, ash trees are under siege. Although collecting ash seeds will not prevent the march of EAB, it could help regenerate ashes once the insects run their course. You can learn more about Jeffrey Karsten's work in the June Nebraska Farmer. UNL agronomy graduate research assistant Samuel Kieschel wants farmers to be aware of the possibilities and benefits that diversification in crop rotation can bring. Samuel is currently conducting an agronomic study based on the planting date for field peas. Field peas can be double cropped with short season soybeans and corn along with grain sorghum, forage crops and cover crops. To learn more about this study, we talked with Samuel at the recent Pulse Crop Field Day. Sure, I wanted the audience to take away uh, after this field day that they go back, back to their operation and there's more possibility and opportunity than just the regular corn and soy rotation that they see every year, that they can diversify their oper operation through pulse crops, whether it be field peas or chickpeas or lentils, and that they also have a possibility to expand uh, that alternative cropping system in their third or fourth year if they're wanting to follow up and uh, expand their corn or soybean op uh, operation to include some of these specialty crops to where they can then in one year have a field pea crop and then come back behind that field pea crop and double crop with a short season corn or soybean or even a grazing cover crop that might improve their soil, um, the soil water infiltration and they can hold more soil within the profile and so if they have a drought year the next year in their corn or soybean rotation whenever they come back around and restart the cycle that they can possibly increase their yield and overall as a system make it more profitable for that farm family to continue some of these th third fourth fifth generation farms and improve their soil and the overall ecology of their farm all in one package. And that seems like it should be a pretty easy sell, but it's really not. It's, it's a, a bit challenging, isn't it, to, to convince folks to do that? Yeah, it is really a challenge for producers if you have the grandfather, father, son figure in that farming operation. They've been doing the same species, whether it be corn, soy, wheat, forever and ever since the family farm was established. And some people view an alternative crop either, either as a threat or a risk that they don't want to take on whenever they're already facing low corn, soy, and wheat prices. Um, and some producers just think that some of these alternative crops like we see here behind us are kind of hippie, organic, that uh, it's just something way out there that they cannot achieve or uh, so. Yeah, it's, it's a challenge, um, but if you present uh, the information in an easy way like we've 
uh, heard today from the producers and then in our field walk here that you know it's not a intimidating risky crop that it can improve and mitigate some of the pests and pressures and get rid of any challenges that they face whether it be from weeds or insects or just managing financial risk um, I think it's a can be a good solution once they realize that. Yeah it seems like education is going to be the key here. Yes correct education if you can get a producer into a field and have them see what the plant can do whether it be from uh, retaining water in the soil, uh, mellowing the soil out. Um, if they dig a plant up, they can see nodulation. They can see nitrogen physically uh, being uh, stored there for the next corn or soybean crop. And you know, a picture is more than a thousand words. So if you can get a producer into a field, that speaks a lot and maybe change their mindset and opinion on some of these crops. And maybe two or three years, they'll implement these crops and be able to change your mind. Yeah, it seems like one of the things that needs to be done is to, to have a little bit more research, a little more history on some of these things. What are, what are some of the things you're working on? Sure, as a graduate student here at UNL, I'm working on two major projects with field peas. One of them is an agronomic study based on planting timing and also the rate and seed density at which we plant these field peas. So uh, if we can increase the amount of time that these field peas are in optimal temperature to grow before we get into June and July where we risk frying all of our blooms and impacting our yield down the road. Uh, so looking to find an optimal planting date and also seeding rate at which we can plant these peas. Then a large rotation study which we're looking at in western Nebraska is trying to replace the summer fallow situation with field peas to mitigate weeds, increase our uh, farm profitability, um, mitigate some financial risk and also retain more water and overall have a more productive farm that uses less water. Al Dutcher is off this week. In place of his usual forecast, we met with Nebraska State climatologist Martha Schultzke at the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Rogers Memorial Farm to learn more about the Nebraska State Climate Office's Mesonet weather stations. So we're here at a Nebraska Mesonet Weather Station. That's uh, the environmental monitoring network that's run out of the State Climate Office. And this happens to be our research and development site. And we have a tall tower here, and we measure things like air temperature, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, uh, rainfall, liquid precipitation, uh, soil temperature at the four inch depth under bare soil and then soil moisture at five depths under grass cover and barometric pressure. So all those variables we measure uh, in this network and we have about 70 stations throughout the state of Nebraska. Among the 70 Mesonet stations, there are four stations in Lincoln, one in Plattsmouth and three near Mead at the UNL Ag Research and Development site. Mesonet stations have been around since 1981 and were originally designed for agriculture, but now they also serve as an environmental mentoring program. As Martha mentioned, these stations are equipped to observe hourly conditions of variables such as air temperature, humidity, liquid precipitation, wind speed and direction, solar radiation, barometric pressure, soil temperature, and soil moisture. To understand how these stations collect all of this data, we further asked Martha to explain how each piece of equipment on or near the station's tower works. So uh, in the gill shield there, we have air temperature and humidity probe. And so a few feet above the ground, we're measuring what the temperature is and what the relative humidity is. We have wind speed and direction. And on this particular tower, it's measured at two different heights. And so we're actually, um, we implemented new wind sensors across the network that are less vulnerable to icing over during the winter time. So we went to a more robust model. And so we're comparing that to the old one to see what sort of difference do we get. So that's why you see two on this one. So we measure wind speed and direction at uh, uh, 10 feet and then at 30 feet. And uh, this is one of the towers that we have. On our other stations, we have a tripod configuration. So we only measure wind speed at one particular height. Uh, and we have three of these towers across our whole network. And we like to eventually go to more towers so that we can look at things like temperature inversions and uh, that would 
uh, bring utility to uh, spray applications and straight d spray drift and those kinds of things. We have a bare soil box that measures um, the soil temperature at the four inch depth, which is a really popular observation uh, in the springtime when it comes to those warming soils and what the temperature is. Uh, we have our precipitation gauge, which is a little tipping bucket mechanism in there. And uh, we're actually testing a new kind of precipitation gauge. And so we're running those side by side uh, out here. And we have uh, barometric pressure, which is something that you can't uh, visibly see so easily, but that measures, do are we in a high pressure, low pressure, and how fast is the pressure changing over time? Uh, we also look at how much sunlight there is, and so we have a little sensor that measures incoming solar radiation, so how much sunlight are we receiving uh, at the surface? And so that's kind of an overview of what we observe across the network. The Mesonet stations are supported by the state of Nebraska in collaboration with the Department of Natural Resources and the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. In addition, there are many agencies and individuals who have contributed to network operations through service agreements for specific stations. As always, all of the data these Mesonet stations provide can be found on the Nebraska State Climate Office website. On the website, there is a map of Nebraska that shows where all of the stations are located. So all the information can be found online uh, in real time. So you can look at the latest hourly observations all across Nebraska at mesonet.unl.edu. And you can also look at yesterday's rainfall, how much rain did we get across the state? What are the growing degree days to date? Uh, what's the uh, evapotranspiration estimates, uh, maximum wind gust, uh, things like that. Thanks, Martha. As always, today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on cattle markets, the benefits of pulse crops, field pea research, and mesonate weather stations. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Next week, DTN's Todd Holtman will join us to discuss corn and soybean markets, and Iowa State Extension livestock economist Lee Schultz will give his analysis of the recent USDA quarterly hogs and pigs report. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jerry Renault, and we'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.